Oh yes, now it's okay. Bye now. Fantastic. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you once again, Guy, and uh, to the organizers of this symposium. Uh, today, uh, as uh, Guy said, I, I would talk about uh, some properties of termiteness, ventilation, drainage, flow through termiteness, microstructural analysis. So in this, what we have done, we have borrowed techniques from subsurface flow research, digital rock analysis, digital rock uh, physics, and also quite a lot of things have been developed in petroleum industry. So my research is quite like focus into CO2 storage, hydrogen storage, or into the oil recovery. But here we've used those techniques and to explore some very interesting problems in termiteness. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge all the co-workers and collaborators uh, who come from very uh, diverse background. And this is really good to bring their own flavor and their own expertise uh, into this research field to solve this really interesting problem. Uh, so we got uh, uh, two collaborators already here, Guy and Christian, who contributed tremendously this, to this topic. So let's get uh, start, started. So. Um, to this community, it's not uh, uncommon to see termiteness and it can grow. They can grow uh, up to seven meter high. So the examples I put here, like only two from India and Namibia, they grow about two meter high. Uh, the point here is the, the structure itself inside can be quite complex, which you can see from the casting images here. Uh, if we look into the temperature profile, this is just an example from a different nest. If we look into the temperature profile outside, depending on the country, it could vary from let's say 15 degrees centigrade to 30 degrees centigrade day and night. But inside the nest, it uh, stays within plus minus two degrees centigrade. So it's quite stable. And we would like to know how the structure itself can offer this much of stability to temperature. And if we know the mechanism properly, hopefully in future, we can design some energy efficient buildings. The second factor, uh, which has been touched upon by uh, Flavio in the, in the first talk uh, at the start of the session, uh, looking into the ventilation, because if you look into these nests here, they look quite blocked and looks like nothing can pass through. Uh, but there are millions of termites living underneath. Uh, with, with they need to exchange carbon dioxide. Uh, in, because these nests, big, they are big ones. They form fungus inside there. They grow there. And sometimes they have got large openings so they can ventilate uh, like Flavio has already pointed out. Uh, but sometimes it can be complex as we can see in smaller nests. Um, whether the question here is whether the, these walls, they look like solid, um, but are, are they porous? If they're porous, how they can allow the ventilation to occur through these? So with these two questions in mind, looking into investigating into the ventilation problems and also looking into the thermoregulation, so we started exploring termiteness from uh, Africa. So they are collected by Christian from Senegal and Guinea. So these are nests in field. And what you see here, the nests in the laboratory. Uh, so these are, not, these are non fungus growing termite nests formed by ternary terms. Uh, our interest was looking into the microstructural properties, but also 3D structural properties of these. Okay, the one way to go do it, we can just cut the nest with a knife or, or any, any some sort of tools and can see the structure. But that doesn't give us real information about 3D. Another way to do is uh, we can use a technique called uh, CT scanning, but you can find in the hospital like a CT scanner here. So in that, what you could do, you can put an object here, a human being or termite nest, and you can throw X-rays from one direction like this, and you collect on the other side, the signal passing through the object. So this gives us a 2D image. And what we can do, we can rotate the whole assembly depending on the machine. And then we collect multiple images at different directions, combine them together, uh, and then get a 3D image. So we use this facility uh, to image our nest, what you see on the top here. And here the red shows the solid material and the yellow is the empty space where termites move around. And qualitatively, uh, the structure here, although these nests, they are about thousand kilometers apart, but they are made by the same species. Um, they look qualitatively very similar. But with imaging or image analysis, we can also do some quantitative analysis 
In this case, we did some thickness mapping in which we looked into the thickness of the inner wall. And for both the nests, the wall thickness are very similar. And also the channel thick thickness very, very similar. Another thing that we looked into is uh, the thickness of outer walls. Um, they are slightly different, but they were significantly larger than the inner thickness of the, of the walls, inner walls. So we, we, we still have to look into the benefits of these if we got larger uh, thickness for the thermal stability. But for the moment, what we, we were interested in looking into, we were looking into the microstructure analysis of uh, the outer walls, inner walls. So for that, we made small samples of the termite nests and then made some mini plugs of about 10 millimeter in diameter. Then we put it into a machine very similar to medical CT scanning. It's called micro CT scanner. So here you can see the sample on the rotation stage. The difference here is uh, it's not the assembly which rotates around the sample here, sample which rotates on the rotation stage here. So the access source and the detector, they are stable. Another difference here is the image quality, uh, the resolution compared to medical CT scanner. With the medical CT scanner, you can get down to 100 micrometer in pixel size, but here we can get down to uh, approximately one micrometer. So the, the walls, which look like very solid block things, we can try to explore the structure inside there and what could be the purpose or the benefit to, of these microstructure to the nest properties. So this is uh, example images of uh, the, the micro city analysis, how the images would look like from the walls. Uh, there are quite a lot of striking features we found. So once you can, one thing you can see here, the empty space here is, is the pores, or you can call it void, where you can, yeah, they're filled with air. So empty space, you see, they got large empty spaces, but we have also smaller empty spaces here. But if we compare with Guinea, we got large empty spaces, but we don't have uh, like tiny spaces like these ones here. So this is the 3D images of the same thing. And we can see the larger openings in both the nests and the fascinating thing was that these openings, they were interconnected throughout the wall. We look into that if there are any benefits uh, of presence of these uh, openings to the nest properties. But first we were interested, we, we did some high resolution images. This one was at five micrometer. Then we zoomed into and we did some local tomography to get higher resolution image with the two micrometer voxel size. And you can see here, uh, this is the image from Senegal. We can see clearly the grains here. And this is the image from Guinea. We can see the grains, but there are not much spaces here inside there. The rather we can see some cracks. And the first impression it gives that uh, it, it could be some clay there, which when it gets dry can give shrinkage cracks. And we did some analysis uh, using XRD, X-ray diffraction analysis. And this, this gives the same indication, same signal. What you see here, all the signal is like Q. Q is quartz, which is made of sand here, sand particles. But here we see many different signals from kalanite, which is a clay, and also some hematite, which you can see here clearly in the image here, which is white stuff, is a metallic stuff here. So this is like a table. What we get out of it, we can see different types of clay here and also the larger quantity of clays in there, which is quite obvious actually, if we see into the uh, satellite image, what we have here is Senegal, it looks quite sandy here, brownish color, and you can expect some sandy particles here. Here you have greenish area, that means um, it should have some clays because you need some uh, moisture retention capacities or nutri nutrient retention capacity so that vegetation can grow there. But this, it was quite nice, uh, quantitative analysis in the same way to see what we have in there. But before moving into what's the benefit of these larger pores, we were interested how they actually formed. They can form either simple construction rules or it can come from geometric properties like when you assemble different palettes together. So we looked into some videos and uh, what termites they do, they go around and then they collect the material they find put into their mouth, compress the material, they can put some saliva and it can form the parrot like that. 
and there was an interesting study from uh, Nikita Zarkaze, um, Zakre, uh, who showed that the, these thermites, they can use any type of material actually to form. It's not the material, special material they need. So they did, they gave, offered them a range of materials. Apart from three different materials, uh, uh, sodium chloride, and there was some uh, hydrophilic, hydrophobic systems like waxes, and also jelly-like structure. Maybe they are too slippery for them. They didn't like forming those pellets. But uh, uh, any other different angularity, rounded masses, so termite never minded those making the materials. So these nests, like for ours, they come from Senegal, as we uh, already looked into. They there's a lot of sand there, so they are quite sandy particles there. So uh, termites, they go around and then they just put everything together and put the saliva together. So the pellets itself can contain the pore structure what you see here. So this is the space inside the pellet. So inside the pellet, so you have many different particles and they form this sort of smaller pore structure. But when you put different pellets together, then they might be, there should be some space in between. For example, if, you, if you're sitting in a room, you fill the room with footballs, but football will not cover all the space. So there will be empty spaces inside. So, so we think that it's the space bit formed between those pallets. So this is quite large uh, space. So this could come from the geometrical problem. So this is interesting. So we wanted to know if, okay, if it made by, let's say, by the simple construction rules or uh, by packing geometry problem, but what's the benefit, the real benefit to the nest properties? So to do that, we did uh, quite a lot of uh, simulations. So we took, let's say, for example, we took the accessibility image, we isolated the pore space, and then we calculated pressure and velocity fields uh, using mass and momentum equations. So this, this simulation, all the simulations would be done here, so they, they, they are done using uh, open platform, it's called open foam. So in this, for example, let, this is a Senegal nest. And what we do, we put a pressure uh, difference across the sample, let's say one map, uh, one Pascal. And then when, then we see oh, the velocity fields based on this pressure difference, you see the velocity profile here in Senegal nest. And you can see the velocity is actually the, all the uh, velocity field they concentrated into some local areas which are exactly where you have larger pores. So if you compare the same thing with the Guinea, so we still see the focus flow field, but uh, there's not much, much, should not be contribution from the smaller pores because we don't have smaller pores there. Now we were curious, let's say in Senegal nest, we have got smaller and the larger pores. And if we, if we can differentiate the difference between these two. So we did two different types of study. So what first we did, we took nest material from Senegal and then we mixed with some water, made some slurry and then let it dry. And the structure which it formed from the slurry, it looks like this. So we call it random pack because it's randomly packed all the grains. And then we performed same sort of simulations and you can see here, the pressure profiles are quite smooth, homogeneous, and velocity fields are quite smooth. And this is expected if you got to quite homogeneous medium, then although we got a few different grains, larger and smaller grains, but we can expect a uniform flow field there. Second thing, what we did, we took small subsets, cubical subsets, uh, where we had only smaller pores, and then we performed the same simulations. And this is, you can see the results here. The velocity profiles, they look very similar to what we have, the random pack homogeneous medium, but it's not exactly the same. So we see the differences, which we will, I'll show you in a couple of slides. So when we start quantifying the velocity fields uh, uh, in terms of making the PDF of this. So what you see, first I compare, before I move on to the smaller pores, first I compare the Senegal nest and Guinea. And you can see the hair, the green and the black lines, they belong to Senegal and Guinea here. And we have larger peaks at high velocity, we can see because of the got concentrated fields there. But we do have quite a lot of stagnant zones here, especially in Senegal. And if we compare with the random pack, we don't see those stagnant zones because we, the porous medium here is quite homogeneous. 
Now this stagnant zone, we wanted to check if the smaller pores are contributing to this. So we took the subsamples and then looked into the velocity profiles and you can see the peaks at higher velocities, but then we got stagnant zones in this quite significantly appearing. So that means it gives us indication that stagnant zone, what we see here into the uh, Senegal nest, they comes from the smaller pores. So this is good. We can see the velocity profiles, but uh, there's a quite a lot of useful information we can get from these simulations. For example, we can calculate permeability from the same simulations. Permeability tells us how easy the fluids can move through the porous media. And this is a plot of permeability versus porosity. And porosity is the fraction of the empty space inside that uh, porous domain. Now, if we compare Senegal versus Guinea, uh, the permeability is uh, same order of magnitude. The porosity is smaller here. The reason because we don't have smaller pores here. But when we compare with Senegal random pack, uh, the porosity and permeability are exactly same like Senegal because here we don't have dead end pores which are contributing to those snack net zones. So the permeability is quite high there already, although we don't have larger pores here. If we compare the smaller ones, uh, if we take the smaller subset here, the permeability is about two order of magnitude smaller. So what it tells us, if by chance we didn't have the larger pores in the nest walls, so our permeability would be quite small. And this has consequences on the nest properties, which we'll see next here. But before that, we're comparing the nest property, ventilation properties. Another simulations, what we did is the CO2 uh, diffusivity we calculated using the same software. So what we're looking here is the Senegal, uh, and then we're comparing against smaller pores in the smaller subset. And again, if we didn't have large pores, our diffusivity, diffusivity would be half of this. Uh, now what we can do, we can combine this information from these simulations and the previous simulations, and we can try to find out the ventilation and we can try to find out if it's advective transport or diffusive transport. And we can use an equation is called Packley number. It has two unknowns here, the velocities, uh, which we call Darcy velocity in petroleum engineering, but it's an apparent velocity. And then diffusivity. And diffusivity comes directly from simulations here. The velocity can be calculated using Darcy's law, but the, the, we have this pressure drop here, viscosity, and then the only missing parameter is the permeability, which comes from our simulations. So these simulations are quite rich to give us the information what we need to, let's say, do this sort of analysis. Now, if Packley number, if you're not familiar with that, uh, if it's more than one, we got advective transport. But if it's less than one, we got diffusive exchange. Then what we did, we took data from literature with the wind sp speed from zero to five, and calculated these Packley numbers, which are ra which range from zero to seven and zero to six for Senegal and Guinea. So what it tells us the importance of both advective and diffusive transport, uh, but depending on the wind velocity outside the termiteness. This is uh, clearly this results are very uh, in, in line with what Flavio has presented in the morning, that we got for this sort of nest, which are like with, with having sort of structure outside not subterranean, we've got both diffusive and advective control there. Another thing what we looked into is the heat transport, uh, is we also did uh, Packley number calculation for heat transfer. So our Packley number is quite less than one. What it means is the heat is transferred through the interconnection of the solids. It just goes through the conduction, but there's not, not much of contribution from advective heat through the pore space, which is sort of expected. If we look into the conductivity, which came from the analysis again, Senegal nest here overall has less conductivity compared to if we didn't have the larger pore space, which again makes sense because if you've got larger space, it provides a cushion or insulation uh, to the nest. The Guinea, we had uh, conductivity quite small compared to uh, Senegal nest. The reason here, is because we got quite a lot of uh, clay in Guinea samples. So uh, this is what we sort of did all the analysis on let's say dry images, but then we asked ourselves a question, 
what happens if if it rains uh, whether we can still see those sort of ventilation properties going on or it could be affected by the water because water can block the pore space so we took the uh, nest so we did first preliminary experiments if it's hydrophobic or hydrophilic uh, christine was very nice so he spilled some water on it it could immediately soaked into the nest so we were clear it's a hydrophilic system it likes it so for example when you do your dishes you have the sponge you put the sponge in water it soaks up the water because of capillary forces so let's say if it drains a little bit then it can be soaked into the outer walls but let's say if it rains quite a lot uh, for example in, in guinea what happens in that scenario so we took a sample this is an image 2d image of the of the 3d sample it's just the cross section uh, again we see air here and the grains and if we spill quite a lot of water on top of it and then what happens and this is the image after three hours because we needed imaging time three hours but we tried to avoid the evaporation we wrapped the whole sample with cling film so this water but you see water here a white color you can see here it's occupying the larger large, smaller space but not going into the larger pores here and we can also do some sort of image analysis here what you see uh, the blue color it shows the connectivity analysis here so what you see here the different colors they show it's a disconnected air component so this can happen very easily for example when we do our research with oil industries or co2 storage so if you would hope if you have hydrophilic system and then you inject water you can have trapping because of snapper processes or it could bypass small po uh, pore pockets some uh, pore pockets so so th this was interesting we, the water doesn't go into the larger pores so this this was what there are two different things can happen either this whole water got trapped which can happen but, or there's another way because it might never be filled because you need higher water pressure to invade these pore spaces. So we can easily do, easily do this sort of calculation. What's the pressure required? And maybe the rain can't give you this sort of pressure. But any of the, anyhow, if uh, any of the conditions under any of the, the conditions, the water doesn't go there. And that means it can offer ventilation as soon as rain stops. So we did uh, simulations again. Uh, with the flow field simulations. Sorry, this plot just shows the water, which pores are occupied water. So water is into the smaller pores, again, indicating that this is a hydrophilic system. So with the simulations, uh, what it turns out to be, because the empty space here, which is not filled with water, it can allow the ventilation as soon as the rain stops, because we got the velocity fields going very easily through that. Although the permeability here is quite small compared to the dry sample, we can see quite a lot of stagnant zones, which is in blue here, but we still see quite a lot of passage of air which can go through. And there are two benefits. One is ventilation. It can be easily done. Second is, let's say we got a lot of water here into the smaller pores, but as the wind flows, it all the channel which is transmitting this air can also help to dry this nest. It can give stability and also it, it can help to give all the dry conditions later on to help more uh, diffuse processes. Okay, so, so far we have collected all this information and we were quite happy because it started as a hobby project and we were managed to able to publish this paper and which also got a lot of media attention. I was very quite excited because I didn't come from this field and the more excitement was when we started doing these public shows uh, people get attracted to this field quite a lot and what they want to they want to see how these termites small creatures can teach us uh, about building new building designs if we can learn from them and we can let's say uh, adapt it into the new building designs or uh, into the materials big materials for example we also did uh, some 3D printing of the nest, uh, which were quite useful for uh, like people could have like, ha like hand, uh, you can see into the nest, they can see through how the, the empty spaces they look like in there. So this was quite useful. We got laboratory here. We can do this 3D printing, which we would like to use in the future for our experiments as well. 
Okay, so far uh, we've looked into uh, the nest in our study, uh, especially with the simulation imaging, looked into the smaller scale features here. But our idea is now to combine these simulations from smaller scale to the larger scale and to solve the problem we started with. We started with the problem, how the thermal resolution is done, how the ventilation is done, because we need to couple many different parameters here. It's not only the temperature, it's not only the ventilation, it has the humidity, high humidity inside the nest. Another thing which we haven't uh, looked into yet the heat capacity of the material. We need to integrate that heat conductivity of the material to come up with some sort of solution. So our plan is to do in the future, to do it like full-time work uh, with the many different things aspect, combine them together. So we would like to do the field studies. We can collect multiple samples. And we also would like to explore different types of termites. So what we've you've seen today is non-fungus growing termites. But if you look into the fungus growing termites, the microstructure here uh, can offer quite high porosity values from the literature it looks like. For here, the microstructure analysis told us the porosity is about 25%. But here we can get up to 45% porosity. And I'm quite curious here, what sort of flow behavior we can expect in this nest here. Another thing we would like to continue, especially integrate the modeling part from small scale to large scale, and then use machine learning tools to adapt the flow patterns into that flow patterns and also, sorry, the structural patterns into the nest. Okay, I think with this, I'd like to uh, wrap. I hope I didn't overrun that time. So what my message here is like, what the, the we were able to achieve with adopting some techniques from different fields, uh, quite fascinating features. We can bring simulations, we can bring uh, imaging techniques, and this has told us some features about ventilation, drainage, and a little bit about thermoregulations or thermal stability of the nest. But there's a quite a lot of things to go further with this and a try on different termite nests and also do some laboratory experiments with under different conditions so that we can fill this information into the modeling protocol. With this, uh, I would like to um, thank you for your patience and listening and also acknowledge different agency also um, although we were not fully funded to do this project, especially me, I was funded by an oil industry, but uh, they gave us sufficient time and also the use of these machines for micro CT. And also they funded many different people, our collaborators. So I'd like to acknowledge these ones. And thank you for your patience. Thank you very much, Kamal, for this nice talk. Uh, <clears throat> all the techniques that you develop are really promising, in fact, uh, to, to uh, better understand the mechanisms that are responsible for uh, thermoregulation and gas exchanges in the nest. Uh, 